Hi, everyone. Alex Savage here at KTVU Fox 2 News in the San Francisco Bay Area. And we want to talk about some of the latest headlines surrounding the coronavirus outbreak. And to do that, we bring in Dr. Vanila Singh, a clinical professor at Stanford School of Medicine and former chief medical officer with the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Dr. Singh, always great to have you on. All right. Let's, Great to be here again. Thank you, Alex. Absolutely. Uh, let, let's talk first about the AstraZeneca vaccine. A lot, a lot of talk about uh, this, this vaccine that we expect to come online here in this country pretty soon. There were some questions uh, about the, the clinical trials and the data that was being released on uh, the vaccine's efficacy. Uh, initially, the company said earlier this week that the, the vaccine was 79% effective at preventing severe cases of COVID, then had to come back and, and adjust those numbers and say they weren't quite right, uh, and then said that it was actually 76% uh, effective uh, in that area. I, I, I'm curious what you make of, of this shift here. Um, is there any, any reason to be concerned that, that we're, we're not getting the most accurate data on the efficacy of this vaccine? Well, so, you know, this is a tough one because it's, it's unfortunate, this vaccine, even with the 76% revised number, is still a very important uh, and, and, and generally overall effective vaccine. And we need that. Uh, Europe needs it. The world needs it. And unfortunately, the company has been marred by messaging and communications with uh, European countries, with their supply chain and product availability. And so it is just a, it snowballed and continues to uh, you know, make this company seem untrustworthy, which at a time like this, we really need the trust from the people, especially those who have some hesitancy to get the vaccine. So I would say that just from a scientific data perspective, it is still a very good number, 76%. They probably went back to revise it. I'm sure there's double checking always going on. And that's a good thing. And they were forthcoming with it. And that's what I would really look at. My hope is that the uh, company can come together with some assured messaging that will give that sort of reassurance to the public. Yeah, it certainly seems like this was more of a, we hope, a more of a messaging blunder um, than anything else. But but at a time like this, when we're trying to overcome uh, the hesitancy that some people have about vaccines, it sort of seems like the last thing you need is for there to be questions about the data that, that one of these uh, drug makers is, is putting out there. Um, what, what do you think, how long is it going to be now that, now that we have this new uh, data set from AstraZeneca, how long do you think it's going to be before it's actually approved for use here in the U.S.? Well, you know, I think the FDA is certainly going to go through and comb the data from their clinical trials. I think that should bring about even more reassurance that uh, another set of eyes, of course, the FDA's reputation has always been excellent in terms of their regulatory prowess and their ability to be uh, in many ways more skeptical than our European uh, counterparts. So I think that's a good thing. Uh, and that will provide yet another uh, reassuring data point. So my hope is that aside from communications and messaging, <clears throat> their review and their expedited uh, consideration of the emergency use authorization will be a boost for the co company's product, the vaccine. And for us in the US, it'll be uh, another reason that we propel forward and meet our goals to get that much closer to herd immunity. Yeah, and we are and we are moving forward certainly in that direction here, especially in the U.S. I mean, the vaccine rollout has been uh, really something something to watch in, in this country. Um, and if you get AstraZeneca online, that gives you a fourth uh, fourth dose that that's out there. And, and actually, and we already know that the U.S. has a stockpile of Astra millions of uh, doses of AstraZeneca on hand as well. We know that because they're planning to give some of them away to uh, some of our neighbors, Mexico and Canada. So uh, the doses are there once it gets approved. Um, uh, President Biden today, I'm sure you, you heard Dr. Singh that uh, President Biden now after, after promising to get 100 million doses delivered in this country in his first 100 days in office, he's now upping that and he's already met that goal and is now looking at 200 million shots uh, in arms here in, in the next uh, couple of weeks or so, next few weeks or so. Um, what do you think of this new goal and, and what do you make overall of, of the way the vaccine is being distributed in this country? Well, look, I'm <clears throat> pleased to hear that. This is the sort of good news we all need to hear 
uh, my understanding is about 169 million doses plus minus have been delivered to Americans in their arms. And so we've well surpassed the 100 million initial goal. And that's that's an important part because it showcased how our distribution, our logistics were able to overcome the initial uh, hiccups that are expected in such a large scale effort. But the 200 million goal, I think we will be able to achieve right now. It's an estimated two and a half million vaccine doses a day. So if you think about in four days, that's 10 million, we'll certainly be able to fill that gap up to 200 million. So this is important. Uh, it's an important movement towards herd immunity. We already have more than half the nation vaccinated, and that's not even counting the people who have immunity from the natural infection itself. And I think we're going to be able to achieve herd immunity actually sooner than uh, people realize. Uh, so that's going to be something to uh, keep in mind for folks as we ease our restrictions and start to um, go uh, dining out, flying around, and those sorts of things. Yeah. Well, it's good to hear you say that, that we, that we may be ahead of schedule on reaching herd immunity, but of course, important to, to, to continue to be cautious. Um, with, with that being said, we have a number of states um, that are, uh, you know, a number of large states really starting to really open up the vaccine eligibility. Uh, you, we were talking about Florida, where uh, they are going to uh, be giving doses now to anyone who's 50 and older. Uh, California is going to be doing that shortly here and by the middle of next month. They say uh, that here in our state, the, the vaccine is going to be eligible to anyone who's over the age of, of 16. That's a big pool of people. I, I'm, I'm curious, you know, we've, we've talked about the supply issues, and there have been supply issues that some of the individual um, mass vaccination sites, especially uh, here in the Bay Area, that we've talked about. So once you get it wide open like that to every, every adult who's out there, um, what, what kind of a rush do you expect we're going to see, and how, how are we going to make sure that we don't run into those same supply issues? Those possibilities are always there of like some hiccups in this, but I think what was really a big problem was there were some supply issues, but the real problem was meeting demand and supply at the same time. So we were having supply issues at the same time, we were having unfilled spots. And by having the criteria expanded, we're getting the motivated people out there, that only increases the number of people out there to gain that immune response from the vaccine and hopefully be that much stronger to fight off a severe infection. That has great important domino effects by decreasing that virus's ability to transmit. And, and there's still a, um, efficacy against those strains. And so by expanding the criteria as is happening in California and the broader nation and the big states like Florida, this, this um, only in my view uh, looks to be that those people who are up and ready to go should get that vaccine. And hopefully that makes a case for those people who might be hesitant to start to turn uh, their, their opinion yeah. around and, and get in line as well. Yeah, I've always I've always felt that 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 is what we would see with you know with, with the the number of people hesitant about getting the vaccine coming down slowly but surely the more that they hear about their friends their neighbors their loved ones um, you know celebrities that they you know that they look up to whatever it might be the more you hear about people you know right. and and respect or admire or whatever it is getting the vaccine um, the more likely you are to to sort of get on board with with the idea. Yeah. You know, what, what's really interesting is that some of the people that I know who are hesitant, many of them are just waiting. They want to see more time, you know, maybe in the back of their mind to have some fear, some concern. They may have sensitivities to medicines otherwise. And, and so every week and month that goes by with more and more people vaccinated, I think it's proof positive for those folks. And for other people, hopefully some of the messaging or the disinformation also gets um, squelched, you know, again, with neighbors, friends, family doing well after their vaccine doses. So I think this is a great uh, public education campaign that's going on for COVID and hopefully for other public health measures to really gain that trust for so many people here in our country and around the world, really. Yeah, it's all about building up that trust. Um, yeah, we're, well, I'm very hopeful about uh, what, what, what you're saying about you know, maybe reaching herd immunity sooner than we might have might have thought before, just based on the way the vaccine's rolling out. So, hopefully, we knock on wood, we we keep things moving in the right direction here. I uh, really appreciate you coming on to talk about uh, all of these issues. Uh, always a pleasure, Dr. Vanila Singh, clinical professor at Stanford School of Medicine and former chief medical officer with the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Thanks for doing it. We'll talk soon. 
Always a pleasure. Thank you.